Hi everybody, welcome back to day two of YouTube Learning. Um, thanks for joining us again today for your daily lecture. Today we're not going to have too much to cover. I just wanted to uh, touch on a few things that uh, might have been some good questions from last night's reading, as well as talk about a couple things, a couple points that uh, Hank Green is going to make in today's uh, Crash Course videos. So first and foremost, uh, some points, and you can, you can look at uh, your uh, Google Classroom to find the exact uh, slides, uh, which I'll post a little bit later today. But what you need to know is that whenever, uh, um, who did we read? Stephen Hawking. Whenever Stephen Hawking is talking about his second question, that was, are there exceptions to any rules within natural law? And he says that miracles are what Christians believe to be exceptions to the rule. It's important to understand that Christians don't think that they're necessarily exceptions to uh, the laws that govern the universe in general. What do I mean by this? St. Thomas Aquinas outlines four laws that you'll need to understand in order to be able to appreciate the Christian perspective on miracles. And what are those four laws? Well, the first law is the human law. That's everyday laws that govern humanity. What are some examples? Well, stop signs are a great example, or taxes, things that influence daily life um, but don't necessarily have any moral character to them. Obviously, we should pay our taxes, um, which is an ought. We ought follow the rules that our society lays for us. But the rules themselves aren't necessarily moral in character. There's nothing moral about stopping at a stop sign, even though we ought follow the laws of our community. Now, what's the next tier of it? Or maybe here's a quick definition for human law. A human law is a law written by a human uh, composed for the governance of a society, okay, on a daily basis. What is a natural law? A law uh, that is natural is a law that governs the way that nature operates. So think about things like the law of gravity or the laws of thermodynamics or the law of the conservation of energy or other things that have to deal with um, uh, heterosexuality is one example of a natural law. That's not, a, that's not an opinion claim, that's simply a natural law claim. Um, what are some other examples of natural law? You might be able to, to figure these out, but an easy one uh, is that human beings should not kill one another. Uh, why? Well, natural laws are laws that are accessible to human reason alone. Uh, we can understand just by observing the reality of other human beings that we shouldn't kill them um, because there is something special about a human person. Now, what is beyond that? Well, the third category of laws that looks down or uh, is over the other two is the divine law. And the divine law is a law uh, designed and written by God for the governance of humanity revealed uh, or that is understandable through revelation. So knowable through revelation, law written by God, um, and it is the path to salvation. So. Uh, in natural law, we would never find anything that would, that would explain how we should treat strangers or enemies. In fact, natural law might say that we should hate our enemies, but rather the divine law says that we should love our enemies and pray for those that persecute us. It's a higher law that governs and looks down upon uh, those other laws. Not in a negative way, but it's just, it's over the other ones. And then the final category of laws is the eternal law, the law known to God alone that governs all things in the entire universe. All things that exist, okay, are within and under the... Um, under the jurisdiction of eternal law. How do those things affect what Stephen Hawking is talking about? Well, when he says that um, Christians believe that God puts law on hold while he performs miracles, uh, that's not what we believe. Uh, in fact, what Christians believe is that uh, natural law is temporarily suspended um, so that way God can teach uh, an aspect of what it means to follow his divine will. So for example, Jesus walking on the water is not possible in nature, certainly. But why does he do it? Jesus walks on water in one reason, uh, to show us that there is no thing that will keep him from coming to us. Not water, and later on, not even death will keep him uh, from coming to be with us in our journeys, in the storms of our own lives. Okay, so God uses, uh, may, he puts aside in a sense natural law, but he's still under uh, the framework that God himself has set up for the governance of the entire universe. So again, the universe is governed first and foremost by eternal law and then by divine law. 
then by natural law, which is the law that governs nature, and then finally by human law, the law that governs society. Okay, I hope that that helps you. Now I want to turn a little bit to uh, what Hank Green talks about in his first video, What is Philosophy on Crash Course? Um, and I wanted to explain why uh, studying philosophy is important in the first place, and I'll be very, very brief. He addresses several different kinds of philosophy. He addresses um, aesthetics, ethics, epistemology, and uh, metaphysics. Now, how do those things affect us? Well, I might look outside and see the beauty of a tree. And I might be able to appreciate what it means for that tree to be beautiful. And that might get me thinking, well, what does it mean for that tree to be a tree? And what makes it a tree? And why do I think that it is beautiful? And then maybe I look at a newborn baby and I think, wow, this baby is as beautiful as a tree. It must therefore be a tree. Well, no, we, we would never think that. As soon as we see a human baby, we would think, oh my gosh, this thing is particularly beautiful. And there's something special and unique about it, which is completely different from trees or any other animal. We don't simply think that human babies are beautiful because we believe that they have sentience and ability to understand things. We don't believe this, one, because babies don't really understand things, and two, because, well, we hold different beliefs for other animals that might be able to understand things. Dogs can take commands. Monkeys can uh, process things at a more advanced level than other animals. Uh, so can dolphins. Um, does that mean that we uh, treat monkeys and dolphins and puppies the same as we would treat a human baby? Well, not necessarily. We're okay with um, puppies and uh, dolphins and monkeys being in cages that at least in some sense uh, makes moral sense. I mean there's an argument to be made about it being wrong but we can see that it's not nearly as wrong as maybe uh, putting a baby in a cage. We can all agree that that's not necessarily a good thing. Well why do we think that? Maybe metaphysically that has to deal with the nature of the being that maybe what humans understand um, in a baby is different from simply a baby's ability to eventually understand things. Maybe the reason why we attribute such value to it isn't necessarily that it's just a continuation of our species, but because there is in fact something to that baby that's different from all other animals. Maybe there is in fact a soul, something eternal, living and residing within um, the mortal body of that infant child. Um, that we can um, that we can recognize. Well, then what do we do with that? Well, we've been able to recognize its beauty, which has then led us to be able to appreciate maybe the metaphysical nature, the real, the the reality of that baby. And then what does that do? Well, then that informs our ethics. That informs how we would treat that baby that then grows up into a full person. Um, we wouldn't uh, do horrendous things uh, to these uh, little kids. Why? Well, because we believe that they're human persons and that they don't deserve to be treated poorly, but rather they deserve to be treated with the proper dignity and respect um, that they deserve as human beings because we recognize what it means to be a human being metaphysically. So that's why philosophy is important because we can appreciate the thing's beauty. It tells us what the thing is and, um, and that appreciation of what the thing is tells us what we ought to do with it. Um, there are certain things that we can do with trees, for example, that we can't do and ought not do with human persons. Um, because a human person is always an end unto itself and never a means or a tool to get something out of it. I hope that this has helped to explain why philosophy is important, uh, not only today, but maybe you can see the ramifications of this importance uh, for future topics. For example, because I recognize the inherent dignity in the human person, therefore I believe that we should perform XYZ actions, that I should give to the poor, that I should uh, provide clothing to those that are naked, that I should um, try and comfort those that are mourning uh, the loss of someone, that I should try and visit those in prison. Hopefully, uh, a proper understanding of our philosophy, our metaphysics, can lead us to, eventually, a proper understanding of our theology. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. I hope you have a great rest of your day.